Welcome everybody to another episode of the Managing Happiness Show where we interview successful entrepreneurs on how they manage to have a happy family life while dealing with the madness of entrepreneurship. Today's guest is John Roman and John does a lot of awesome stuff and he's very much in line with the things I'm passionate about. He's a number one best-selling author of the book called The Front Row Factor. He's the host of the Front Row Factor podcast. He has the Front Row Dads Retreat and the Front Row Foundation, which is similar to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So it's really, really awesome, the stuff that he's doing. And I'm super grateful to have you on the show, John. Oh, man, this is fun. I'm excited to be here. Let's do it. <laughs> I really love what you do. Um, and um, I'm curious why you got into the things that you're doing. So why did you start Front Row? Yeah. Well, you know, most people, and I think where where we can get to sort of the perfect storm in my life is right around 2005 when we started Front Row Foundation. Um, and there's a lot that happened, of course, as in, in all of our lives leading up to big transformations. And sometimes it's hard to identify all the key moments and elements because there feels to be so many that uh, create this tipping point in our lives. But there are three things that happened for me that were really significant. One was that it was on my 30th birthday and I was going to see Jason Mraz. I'm a big fan. Um, and uh, for anybody out there, he's a musician, fantastic singer and, and performer. And uh, I was back row of this concert with my girlfriend. And I remember looking down and noticing the difference between the front row and the back row. Uh, and, and it was just energetically the experience people were having. And I, you know, it hit me that this metaphor of being in the front row was sort of an example of people that were actively pursuing life. The girls that I saw in the front row that were standing up and shouting out requests and they were fully part of the event. And we felt, or I felt, more like a spectator that day. I felt like I was there just kind of watching other people have a good time. Having a good time. Yeah. And I thought, you know, this is sort of how I've played a good portion of my life, watching other people engage. And I thought, what would it be like to live a front row life? What would it be like if I wasn't afraid to sing in front of other people or to stand up and dance? What would it be like if I stood in line and waited for tickets or made more money that I could buy front row seats or had friends that invited me into the front row. I don't know. I just started envisioning this. So that happened and that was sort of like an isolated incident. The second thing that happened to me was uh, I had been on this journey of personal growth. But, and one of my, my mentors and my leaders in life was Tony Robbins. And he would challenge people constantly to evaluate their contributions to the world. You know, some people think of personal growth is always about us and what we're doing for ourselves and how we're going to have the lifestyle and all these things. But a lot of our fulfillment comes by way of what we share, what we give away. And I just kept thinking, you know, how do I rate my contribution to the world? How do I feel about it? And I wasn't really excited about what that meant. And I don't think it's about the dollars that you give. I don't think it's the amount of hours that you contribute. I really think it's about what you could be doing in that moment versus what you are, your potential in that space. And I was not living up to my potential with contribution. So I had this sort of nagging in my mind as well about like, how am I going to give back? And then the third thing that happened was I, my buddy invited me to run a 52 mile marathon. Now, I was not a runner uh, at all. Oh, and, and by the way, I don't even know if I translate that. What is that, like 80 kilometers or something? But it was... It, it, it's brutal. A full marathon is 26.2 miles. And so this was just back-to-back -back full marathons. And I, I was at this season of my life of just saying yes to things that I had maybe no business saying yes to. So I was like, watch Yes Man. I was like, yeah, exactly. By the way, love that movie. Like, really, by the way, a funny movie, yet profound all at the same time. And I remember saying like, yeah, let's do it. I'm in having no idea how to get that done. Um, and, and, and literally, literally never having run more than two miles in my whole life. Like I was not a runner. I never ran track. I would never run a, I'd never run a 10K, a half marathon or a full marathon. And our first event was going to be a double marathon. But what I thought was, you know, I was, I was in the business of looking for and what a lot of people today would call hacks, that's not even a word that was on my radar at the time, but I thought, I do value learning from other people. I do value um, figuring out potential and big levers to pull. And so anyway, these three things are all happening in my life. What happened was we were on a training run for this 52 miler 
And I, I said to my buddy, I was like, you know what? What else are we doing this for? Like, why else are we running? Shouldn't there be a deeper purpose to this than just crossing the finish line? What if we raise money for a charity? Like, wouldn't that be cool? And that conversation led to, well, what if we started our own charity? And then it was like, oh, like, what would that be like? What would you do? What problem would you solve in the world? And we started exploring it. And we started thinking about like, well, if you're going to give to a charity, shouldn't you be clear about what are you, what problems do you want to solve? And also what, what do you love in life? Because I think that that the, the what are we moving away from and what are we moving towards are huge. So uh, my greatest fear was wasting my life, not getting to the end and having a full life, like somehow sleepwalking through and then on my deathbed looking back and saying, God, I, I didn't even show up. I didn't do life. I, I wasted it. And my greatest love was experiences in life, you know, moments with our friends that we could talk about them forever. I wanted to live an epic life with all these amazing experiences. I thought if I care so much about that, what if we help people who are fighting for their life have the best day of their life? And right when we said that, it was like everything clicked. And in that moment, I shouted out Front Row Foundation. And I said, we put people in the front row of their favorite event. And it was like a hell yes moment in life. And literally within a week, we had written a mission statement, submitted it to the IRS to be an approved charity. And that was the birth of this whole thing. So um, that's what, that's what, that, that's where this whole journey started. And then, you know, since then it's been a wild ride of a lot of different tangents of that, but, you know, we're now uh, almost 12 years in on the charity. We've raised millions of dollars and we've helped, uh, a lot of individuals have the best day of their life and then find a community of people that can help them live every day in the front row. That's really awesome. There's so many things that I, um, you know, have, have very deep thoughts on and, uh, one thing is in terms of the deathbed, I also had a very similar experience when my um, my backstory is I've always been an entrepreneur and always kind of following the quote-unquote American dream of amassing as much stuff as possible and thinking that I'm going to be happy, you know, when I have like, you know, when I'm a millionaire, I'm, I'm going to be happy. And then like, oh, still not really happy. And then like, maybe we have to add a zero to be happy. It's a, it's a, it's a, but it's like this, you know, very, very unfulfilling kind of like, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a it's a trap you know don't don't fall into this and um i always had this urge to have a big impact in people's lives and to improve people's lives and um but i was like kind of off not really following this i was just like chasing paper so my my i was climbing up the ladder of success like a mad person but never really checking is this ladder leaned against the right wall that i actually want to climb up you know just like following the you know, the, the dream of the world right now, like what other people tell me that that what makes me happy. And the big wake up moment for me was when my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer three and a half years ago or so. And knock on wood, we just had a follow up. She's doing great. But back then this really hit me really hard because uh, I lost both of my parents to cancer. So, so this was like a, you know, uh, you know, hit, hit home really hard. And I envisioned me laying on my deathbed thinking, did I really do what I was supposed to do? Did I live the life that I want to live? Did I have the impact that I want to have? And, um, you know, my, my business back then, Maxi then was, was doing really great. And we're having an impact in our employees' lives, you know, but we're, I was not having a bigger impact. And so this was the moment when I realized that, hey, I have to, have to change something and do something different. And this was for me, you know, made it very easy for me to decide to sell the business and focus on something else and i thought really long and hard about like wh what is it that i can do to have a positive impact in people's lives and um i had this epiphany f a few years ago when i came home from a roles and responsibility meeting in my business and i was sitting on the couch with my wife and my daughter and my daughter back then still in diapers needed a diaper change and um i told my wife hey honey emma needs a diaper change my wife got really upset that i pointed out to her and I didn't, I didn't do it myself, you know, <laughs> sounds familiar maybe. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought like, why are we fighting about this? My wife changed her diapers most of the time and I'm totally cool with doing it. You know, it's no problem at all, but how should I know that it's my turn the second, you know, and why are we fighting? I, I want to avoid this, this nonsense fighting. And then I realized we never talked about the roles and responsibilities in our life. And the next morning we sat down and just spelled out who does what and when and who's responsible for what. And this took away all these unspoken expectations that had built up over the years. And, you know, all this uh, like resentment that has, you know, came through this. And it's like, 
often just because we didn't communicate it properly and you know my wife was expecting things from me i had like no idea that you know she she thinks that that that's that's my thing right and after doing this has had such a profound impact on our relationship that we probably 80 percent of all the fights that we ever had just disappeared you know and and i thought like holy cow if this works so well maybe we can take other aspects from business and apply to our personal life because all this stuff we do in business like having a mission statement having a vision statement having roles and responsibilities having regular meetings setting goals budgeting like all that stuff you just make you do in the business to make sure this group of people in the business is aligned there's no friction and they're successful and you know people have spent countless dollars and hours to perfect this right they even teach at universities there's professors that focus on how to do business well mm -hmm. and you know like not, not a fraction of this effort went into making family work right mm -hmm. but the beauty is that the family is also just a group of people so it translates over really well from one to the other yeah. right and um, so we started doing this to implement all these things like having regular meetings setting goals mission statement vision statement core values and all that stuff into our family and this had such an amazing impact on my family that i became very passionate about sharing this with others and this is how managing happiness the course and the podcast and, and and all this stuff start right now so i can can really relate and you know with with front row dads what, what you're doing and check out your website it's very similar to you know the concepts of uh, i have to tap open um the the stuff that you mentioned there um what's in the course where is it like having you know, communication big thing you know or, or values big thing discipline i'm also like a huge fan of like i'm also a personal development geek i love tony robbins and i've you know read every book under the sun in terms of personal development and I'm a big believer in, in creating the right habits. I believe our habits are the things that make us, that are everything with, yeah. uh, for us. If they determine if we're successful or broke, if we're healthy or sick, if we're happy or unhappy. You know? So like it's um, you know, very similar. I really love what you do with, with, with front row dads. I'm, I'm curious how you got into the front row dads. Like why did you start focusing on dads? Yeah. Well, for the last 10 years, I've been... My, I make a living as a keynote speaker. So I've been traveling around giving these speeches and loved every minute of it, loved to travel, love meeting new people. But after having two kids, I have an eight-year-old and a three-year-old, being on the road that much um, started the... the when you know the the pros of traveling and seeing the world um, weren't outweighing the cons of leaving my family, so I started looking at well, how can I make my world more harmonious? And I think this is a question all entrepreneurs need to be asking: is how can I lay out all the things I want to do, things I feel called to do, the ways I can make money as an entrepreneur and take care of my family or and whatever it is, and how do I want to contribute to the world? Kind of lay them all out and then ask: how are they all connected? Because it's tough when we do all these different things and they happen to be serving different groups or, you know, that they require different skill sets. How, how, what works in harmony with one another? How can I be smart here with this? And ultimately for me, being a great dad was at the very top of my list. And I thought, well, I know how to run live events. I know how to facilitate communities. Um, why wouldn't I have an event around the very thing I want to be talking about anyway. Because <laughs> I was looking at my day going, when do I have time to talk about being a dad? When do I have time to read about? It? I'm like, well, what if I made that part of my business model? That feels great. <laughs> and awesome. so I thought, well, I've got what I have. My resources is I have a big network. I have a big community. Why don't I offer up to these guys that I know would value this? Uh, why don't I offer this up? And sure enough, 35 guys came from all over North America. We had an amazing retreat. This is a year ago. So this is fairly new. And since then, you know, this will be our, our third retreat coming up in October in Santa Cruz, California. Um, and and I'm, I'm just so pumped about it. And, and here's what it is. There's two things that happened to me that caused me to really make the leap. Once I knew there was this harmony and I really liked that idea, I thought, because mm, I was in process of it, I said, first, I looked at my computer and I was like, I'll look at it right now. I'm actually on my screen. I'll say, so I have this, I have an operations manual for our company. I have a folder for my podcast and the blog. I have a, a folder for uh, speeches and I have all these folders, right? And I was like, but where's my family folder? Mayful. You know, and, and, and I thought, wow, oh, you know, I've spent all this time sitting down thinking about my business and all that, but where's the family folder? So that was one. And you and I have similar stories here, right? This is, this is very interesting. So the second one was that I was at a party and somebody asked me what I did. And I went into my normal 
pitch about like, oh, I speak or I, it's like the typical, you know, how I answer that question between speaking and writing and running the charity. And I, and I stopped myself and I was like, no, hold on. I, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. That's what I like. That's what I actually do in life. When I'm not doing that, I happen to like speak and write and run this charity. And that shift for me was massive that I wasn't a speaker and an author who had a family. I was a family man who had a speaking and writing side yep, thing. Yep, yep. Getting priorities Getting straight. my priorities straight. And, I, you know, I would have told you that my priorities were aligned. I would have told you that my family came first. Like, if you asked me, like, does family come first? I'd be like, yeah, yeah, sure. Like, I would have yeah, told you that. Everybody says That's this, right. But, how but, anybody but when you look at your calendar, does your calendar reflect that? When you look at how you speak to people, does it reflect that? And so even like on my Facebook bio, it's like, who are you? And it's like, I had to change it to be like, I'm a father and husband. And then I'm these things and remembering to put that first in my life. Because listen, if you play that out to the end, imagine your life where you're successful in business and you crush it in the podcasting world and you wrote bestsellers, but you failed as a dad. Is that a life you're really going to be proud of? Um, and then I flip it and I go, if I crushed it as a family man, if my, if I was the best dad and somehow I failed in business, that I, I would look back with regret on the fact that I failed in business. Of course, I would have wished that I would have succeeded, but I would not look at my life as a failure in that sense. Like I would... I would say, you know what? It didn't turn out like I wanted it to. Now, clearly, I'm looking for success at all levels. I'm looking to crush it in business and in my family life. But if I have to, if I have to give away one, to pick one, if I had to pick one, I, I would pick the family all day long. The family all the way, yeah, all day long. Yeah, and that to me was the big deciding factor. So, it's uh, with these agreements that we make with ourselves. Did you read the book, The Four Agreements? Oh yeah, Don Miguel. Just for before, sure. before the podcast, we classic we, we talked man, about that. love We're both that. book nerds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, one on the top three of the books that had the biggest impact on on my life. You know, kind of having these agreements in your head. Um, you know, if you want to be the world's best entrepreneur and you also want to be the world's best dad, if you don't, you know, pick either one, uh, you're always going to have this chat, this noise in your head in terms of, you know, it's going to be really hard to, to make the right decision. And, um, something that I started doing, I, for me, it was not the folders on my desktop, but it was uh, when I do my, my, uh, weekly planning or monthly planning on, you know, my, sitting, looking at my calendar. I was just 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 planning my business and not realizing that I'm actually hey when, when I started this I was you know I was a a father I'm a spouse I you know have my business back then I was a toastmaster so this was also a responsibility that I had but I was like you know always just focusing on the business and family was always an afterthought you know giving 100% the business and expecting or hoping that magically somehow the family life kind kind of works and when you run your own business, it's very easy that you get sucked into this because like the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? So you kind of always fo focus on, on this business thing. And for me, the reminder is to have this on top of my calendar to when I do my planning, like I look through my, my, my roles in my life and see if I, if I actually, you know, addressed all of them, you know, but there used to be both my parents passed away. Otherwise I would have son as one of the roles mm -hmm. as well, you know, because like thinking back when, my my mother was still alive. I was like, you know, um, we had a great relationship, and we, we I moved from Germany to to the states, so we didn't see each other that that much. And kind of um, thinking back, I would have definitely talked to her more often if I would have had these priorities straight. And it's like kind of one of the regrets that I have in my life that I didn't focus on this earlier. So it's you know, that's uh, that's funny how how many similarities we, <laughs> yeah. we have going on. I love it, man. Also, with, with harmony that you mentioned, also I'm a big believer in that you have to somehow, you know, fi find harmony in your life, that you're like a like a biodome where everything in there coexists and there's no tug of war between, you know, like work-life balance is like a, a a really bad word because like, you know, it should not be a balance, it should kind of like all kind of somehow work, work together. Yeah. Yeah, our, 100% our lives are an ecosystem. You know, my buddy John Berghoff constantly compares business and families to nature. He believes, and I believe, that if you look around into nature, you can find a lot of wisdom. And in nature, um, you know, there is an ecosystem that's created. And, uh, and, and that is our lives. And things need to be in a, in a, per, in a system that functions so that the different... Um, 
you know, species of our life, if you will, uh, will, will all have a chance at survival, you know? Hmm. Not like Australia where you have, you know, where they brought rabbits and there's like no <laughs> natural right, a, right. A predator and they you know, just get out of control. I'm very big on, on mission statements and vision statements because it, you know, was very impactful in my business. We First, we didn't have one, then we found one and we really took off and then we lost it because we never really wrote it down and we didn't communicate it over and over to our staff. And, we you know, we hired new key people in, in key positions, like a new head of engineering, new head of sales. And they brought in their own ideas because we never really told them what our, our, our mission and vision was. So we started to walk into 10 different directions, which really slowed us down until we realized this and then got our act together again and you know wrote it down and communicated it to everybody and also in my personal life i use my my mission and vision statement and my core values as a decision filter if with all the big decisions that i want to make i just like run it through through this list of you know values and and my, my north star to see if it's in line you know like helps me a lot with removing FOMO from my yeah. life you know because like there's so many things you could do and uh you know I have ideas all day long or people approach me say like hey man you want to work on this business together or you want to invest here and often I would just like do it kind of being being the yes man you know but then uh um and it's really hard to say no often because it's a good opportunity or I like the person but like when I just go back to my you know my vision mission values and I use this as a filter. It's very easy to say no to these things because, and it's also, you know, I don't feel like a dick when I say no because it's like something that I want to stand for. Yeah, that's right. It really helped me to to write this down. So, so I'm, I'm curious if you have um, for your business or for yourself, if you have like mission, vision, values. We have written, out. Of, of, you know, we've written versions of that in many different places like we've written them for the charity and the business and family we've written out values and vision visions and missions you know it's interesting is i i don't have like a a big mission statement that i would share with people that i've memorized and i repeat i would share with people oftentimes what visions are that we have or values that we have and i repeat those constantly and i tell those stories constantly so i'm clear about what we value i'm clear about the statements that we make and i think if you put them all together you end up with our vision and our mission right like and 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 the analogies that we use to help people understand who are we really for for example people will say well what does front row foundation do and um now first of all people really get it when you tell a story like of a person for example i could tell somebody that front row foundation helps kids and adults who have a life-threatening illness experience the live event of their dreams from the front row and that's sort of like this you know the canned answer i could also tell you that you know in 2007 we helped a little girl named sophie who was four years old to go see kelly clarkson and we got her backstage and there's a moment I'll never forget when this little girl who had a brain tumor and fighting for her life um, was there with her family and she got a chance to meet Kelly. And we have this picture of this little girl and Kelly locking eyes with these two bright smiles and then Kelly holding little Sophie for a good 15 minutes and just talking with her and connecting with her. And um, why that picture is so valuable um, is that uh, Sophie lost her battle to this brain tumor um, just a month or two after this event. And to this day, I'm still connected to her mom, Lauren. We are great friends. We celebrate Sophie's life. We talk about Sophie's event. And one of the things I didn't recognize early on was that you know, families would express to me that one of their fears was having a loved one be forgotten. And that's when we determined that one of our missions was that when somebody gets connected to front row, this is a forever thing. So we say it's a forever thing. Um, we always say, welcome to the front row family. We really like, and even just recently I posted in our Facebook group, I was like, who are we to each other? And everybody responded, we're family. And I thought, you know, listen, is our family better than everybody else's family? I was I'm not in the business of comparing our family to other people's, but this is our family made up of unique DNA, unique people coming together with a common goal of being moment makers. That's another value we have. And moment making is about looking at our lives and saying, look, we know, tomorrow is guaranteed to nobody. We don't know how many moments we have. So let's make the most of the ones we've got whether favorable conditions or not, you know, sometimes life deals us a very difficult hand and we have to make, we have to do what we can with what we've got. 
you know, I'm constantly impressed by the people in our charity that um, face difficult situations and then have an incredible outlook about it. And it's not that our, our community doesn't get sad or down or have bad days. It's that we rally together to live this, to run this race of life together and to be there for each other and show up for each other and be in one another's front row. You know, I think about the incredible people, you know, that we've served and, and, and how they articulate our mission, which is to amplify the stories that are powerful. We say amplify the good so we can silence what's not. That's what we do in life a lot of times, right? Like, hey, there's things we can't change. It can't change that. That's just the way it is. Uh, there's a lot of things we can change, but some things you just can't change it, right? So you've got to accept and move forward with what you've got. So an example of that would be Nikki, who went to go see a Dallas Cowboys uh, football game a number of months ago. And in the limousine, she says to me, um, she's talking about how in chemo and radiation she had lost her hair and it was growing back and it was really short and it was it was uh it was a different color and how it, you know she just didn't look at her best and she would go into these restaurants and in public and if she didn't wear a hat or a wig or something people might look at her with disgust and when she said that the minute she said the word disgust my my heart broke for her, you know, and it was like, I was angry almost. I wanted to like wring the neck of that person that would do that to her. And then she said, surprisingly, she goes, and it makes me happy. And I was <laughs> like, do tell, tell me more about that. Why does that make you happy? Because I want to kill them. And she said, it makes me happy because if they look at me with disgust, oh, that means that they've never had cancer themselves. And they certainly don't know anybody they love that's ever had cancer. Oh, she wow. goes, so, so I'm happy that they don't have any context to my situation. And I was like, you are a better person wow. than me because I would have just, I'm, I'm, I'm quick to jump sometimes to judgment and anger and talk about why that person's rude or whatever it is. And I'm constantly surrounded by people, Dave, that have this incredible perspective on life. And I think that's what being in the front row is about. You know, the front row is a metaphor for uh, being a, a spe being a sorry a support to other people, we 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 it's very fancy in the personal growth industry to talk about like don't be on the sidelines in life, like get on the field, get on the stage, and a lot of it's like be the star, be the superstar, and I that's great. Some people need that lesson right now to get on the field and play the game and, you know, get it. What and, and that's a great metaphor. I don't need any explanation. It's totally thumbs up from me. I also think that we undersell the metaphor of being in the front row for other people, like the value of lifting someone up. Like if you think that you're a per you think you're a spectator when you're in the front row screaming and chanting, man, the best fans get the best shows, right? So we tell these stories. We wrote about these stories in our book, The Front Row Factor. We spent two years telling the stories. So we say, we share everything that you can learn about life from people fighting for it. So our vision, our mission is to tell the stories, is to give the strategies, to pass along information that we learn from these incredible people. And so that we form a family, so that we make our difference in the world in only the way that we can, so that we make the most of all of our moments. That's really our true vision. That's really our true mission. And so, you know, while that you know is written on our website and you can go read our mission statement and our visions and all those, that's the story I like to tell. I like to tell the story of like, you know, yes, like I, I envision one day the grand vision, you know, is that, man, there's not a single event taking place around the world that doesn't have somebody in the front row from our charity. That would be awesome. Or that, you know, our logo is the guy with the hands up like this. And, uh, you know, for those who can't see, by the way, I'm like pointing two fingers to the sky. Like you'll see people do in the front row and they're rocking out their favorite concert. And it's like, I envision like that being the way people want to celebrate moments. Um, and they're like, you know, now in our community, people are like, let's take a picture. Everybody front row and people's hands all go up. Like these are visions we have that are fun. Um, but man, listen, we just want to be our best selves. We want to, we want to live epic lives and help other people do the same. That's really awesome. I think like also your your personal values and personal mission statement is super aligned with what you do in in your work, you know, with 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 front row. All so, of it's aligned like 100%. Like, no, no real difference. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost really silly awesome. like if, if you love people you pay me <laughs> a lot of money to come speak about the charity. Like it's There's, great. Yeah. yeah. I literally get to tell stories about the charity and like, I, I would do I, like, that's, that's a, it's just great. It's so perfect. <laughs> yeah. If you really find the stuff 
if you've in a German language it's um we don't say the word we don't use the word job we only use the word job for if you are a student and you work at a pizza place mm -hmm. to make some money on the side right that's that's what we, we use the English word job but the word for a proper job in German is Beruf which comes from the word Berufung which means calling mm -hmm. you know so actually you kind of live live your calling that's right when you do do this then you don't really work work an hour in in your life because you really do what 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 you yeah, love doing right it. doesn't doesn't feel like work that's it i had this guy who was in tech support that we hired him for for tech support and i saw like week two that dude you're a marketer you're like amazing <laughs> marketing. you have to be marketing and he's like no 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 man i, I want to stay I, I like the tech stuff you know i want to maybe program i want to stay here and i worked on him for a year and then i talked him into moving to the marketing department and he told me like almost every week, I can't believe I'm getting paid for doing this. You know, so I guess like, you, know, awesome. you, you have a similar feeling about this. What he said with, um, you know, self help -y, like telling people like, hey, you have to be on the on stage or you have to kind of, you know, go into to the front row and, you know, versus the, the, the service aspect. I think for some people, if like people are very introverted, then it may make sense to kind of come, come out of the shell if they're introverted for, you know, for driven by fear or being uncomfortable you know i'm i'm I, I call myself a recovering introvert i used to be very introverted and you know over, over the years being an entrepreneur and a very good friend of mine Said baki who i um also interviewed for the podcast he i met him at a uh, at a conference and he he showed me how to network and how to be outgoing and was like kind of almost took me by the hand and introduced me to all the speakers the event organizer and this was like such an amazing experience that i really got hooked yeah. and worked really hard on, on getting more yeah. extroverted you know and uh it's it's really fun to not you know before i always like kind of was rather filled with i would never do a podcast or public speaking you know i would have like, rather preferred to shoot myself in the yeah. face rather than going i stage, totally get you know? that but, uh, hey you know on this topic i think this is really important because out there listening there's going to be introverts and extroverts there's a book written by a woman susan kane have you heard of this one called quiet it's the power of an introvert in a world that can't stop talking. And she, in fact, uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, John Berghoff, one of my closest friends, was mentioned in that book because he's one of the best leaders and he's introverted. Um, so you might not even know it, that he has extroverted tendencies that he's developed over time and really worked at. Um, but he, you know, introverts and extroverts, like as an extrovert myself, by the way, there's many moments in life that I need to be introverted to recharge as well. It's not that I only recharge by people. I think that we have both, it just to, to varying degrees. I think it's important for for, it's important for people to recognize that the metaphor of being in the front row isn't always about standing up and screaming and dancing. That may not be your style. Being in the front row is a metaphor for getting close to what makes you come alive. Being in the front row is about, we call that the proximity principle, right? This is about what's, what you're close to creates. You know, if you, if, that's why when people will pay top dollar to be in the front row, because the experience is different right? Students that sit in the front row get better grades because they eliminate distractions. Life is about focus. So what I want to explain to people is that this isn't even about the front row. Like when I go to the movies, I don't want to be front row. This is about your front row. <laughs> this is about the best seat in the house for you, right? Where is that perfect spot in your life to be close to the thing that you can then cheer on and get a better show back in life? right? That's what, that's what we want to know, that where you can create an impact, where you can get ultimately connected, that is the front row experience. Not the front row and not how you do the front row. It's about you finding mm -hmm. your sweet spot. That's really awesome. How do you teach people this? I mean, you wrote, wrote yeah. the book, but do you, and I guess you speak like, and you have the podcast, so I guess like these yeah. are your... Well, there's, I, there's I guess, a science the and an art. You know, there's a science and an art. And there's no doubt that, by the way, a lot of the stories that we tell inspire people. And, you know, a lot of times we, when we read a great story, when we read an inspirational story, when we read about Nikki and her perspective on that person who judged her, you know, maybe uh, inappropriately uh, and how it made her happy, when we read those, we get to 
uh, now adopt their mindset. We get to choose that now new way of being. So I think that people are transformed when they read great stories. And our book is filled with great stories. Um, you know, I also feel that it's good to point out the science that proves some of the concepts that we talk about. So in the book, we talk about that there were three forces at work in, in when looking at 11 years of all these recipients that we've we've worked with, we said there's three forces. One was the power of hope. And so we tell stories about why hope is important and how hope moves us. See, hope is not to be confused with wishful thinking because wishing something were different is not empowering to you. But 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 having hope makes you feel that you can make the difference. And, and hope is like bringing the power of the future into the present moment. So one of our recipients, Thomas, wanted to go see the Rugby World Cup. And when we told him he was going, he worked harder in physical therapy to be able to stand up for the national anthem. That's bringing the power of the future into the present moment. Or we watched people who who looked at their videos and their pictures and their photo books over and over and over again, and they we saw them celebrating the past and uh, and bringing that power into the present moment, which which healed them, which was a positive distraction, which gave them something positive to focus on, and and we learned about the power of celebration. And what we realized is that on either side of these, one is into the future, the other one's into the past. That all we're doing is learning how to manage the moment. And we're using the future and we're using the past to bring power to now. And that's really all we have. We're all trying to live in the moment. We're all trying to be more present for this experience in life. And so we teach people practical strategies for how to do that. How do we celebrate our past without feeling like we'll look, we're always looking in the rear view mirror? That's very different, right? Like, oh, you know, you're always living in the past. There's a very fine line between celebrating things, anniversaries, good decisions, highlights in your life, and, and also how to bring the power of the future, visions and images of what we want to create and how that shapes us. So yes, we tell stories and yes, we give science that backs up the things that we talk about, like all the research of positive psychology coming out of like University of Pennsylvania, headed up by Martin Seligman or Barbara Fredrickson, or all these incredible people who are researching what used to feel a little woo woo. Like people talk about hope and that feels a little soft, or they talk about celebration and they're like, ah, let's not focus on that. Let's talk about action and results. And I'm like, I'm, uh, we got, re we've got real science now that tells you why our strategies makes sense. Like they're practical. We knew them in our heart. We could see them happening, but now we're showing why. So yeah, I mean, I, I could talk forever about it. You know, there's, and, and, and I'm not going to keep going here, but if, unless you want to talk about it, but you know, I, I gave you, there were three forces. We also talk about three areas of focus that people need to be working on. One is, uh, and they're all questions based, right? Like, like how do we make the most of every moment, which is manning our, managing our mindset. We talk about who's in our front row of life, which is managing our relationships. And then uh, what environment makes us come alive, which is all the things that surround us that affect the way we feel and behave in our lives. Those are the three areas of focus. And we, you know, again, we dig into, it took us two years to write. It's 300 pages of just uh, stories and, 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 and strategies of how to make this work. But uh, it, it's, um, it's been a game changer. Yeah. The, by the way, I want to celebrate something here on the podcast in case anybody read the book and you've already checked it out. Thank you, by the way, because the book hit number one on Amazon um, on day one, and we're really pumped about it. That's awesome. Thanks, ben. Congratulations. I'm I'm also a big believer in um, envisioning things, you know, and not kind of just. I think wishing things feels like the secret, right. the movie or the book, the secret. You know, I just have to sit there and and wish it, and it's, and it's going to happen. And you know how you described hope is like more the Napoleon Hill approach to getting, you know, work working hard, but still, you know, kind of having envisioning where you're going to, you know, or what what you're That's going right. to accomplish. Um, you know, so it's. Uh, I 100% agree with this. Um, you said another thing about with being of service, you know, that that's um, cheering somebody on or providing a service to somebody. I think it's a very, very important thing. And I, I realized that this is, I think most people, when they really dig, dig in deep, you know, they'll realize that, you know, just making money will not make them happy. But like being of service for others is the thing that makes us, us the happiest, you know, like that's, the motivation why I do what I'm doing because I want to improve people's lives. When I see the effect of this, you know, then then it makes me happy. Or they they also did uh, 
I think it was a TED talk that did this study where they gave students $20 bills and 50% of the students, they told, they told them to buy something for themselves and 50%, you know, was right. supposed to buy a present for somebody else. And then they check like, right. how happy are they at the, at the end of the day, you know, and it's like being of service, like really, really powerful. And if, if you understand it's going to um, improve your life. Quite when a I bit. take my son, Dave, to the arcade, my rule is that I get him a thing of coins and I say, for every game you play, you have to give one away. So I watch oh, him walk awesome. around, play that's a game, really and then cool. walk up to a kid and you know, that's and then so give awesome. away some coins. That's so, so um, awesome. And and I think what's cool is that he oh. also learns that not everybody accepts your gifts. You know, one of the interesting things about that is as soon as I say that, people might imagine that he walks up to a kid and the kid's like, Oh, thank you so much for the coins. You're awesome. But no, like, what actually weird, happens like, is, yeah, people this? look at him like, um, something's wrong with that coin. Like, what do you want from me? Why are you like <laughs> parents will be like, no, 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 don't give my kid a coin. I don't. This comes with a string no, yeah. attached to it. I'm sure <laughs> like you're going to I'm going to owe you yeah, something. Yeah. Right? What are you selling? What's what, the catch? What's the deal? Yeah. And, and that's a fascinating thing. Right. Because that's actually one of the reasons that we, we that 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 people stop giving is that they actually think it's all going to be just you know rainbows and unicorns when they go give a gift to somebody but giving is actually a little bit of work giving comes with challenges just like everything else um so i think that's important for people to know going in i had a <laughs> I was uh, back in LA when I was living in LA. Um, I was in my car and there was like a homeless person standing on the side of the road begging for the cars that were st you know, stopped at the at the traffic light. And I wanted to give him something and I looked around. I only had plastic on me. You know, like I didn't even have a, have a quarters. But I looked around my car to see if there's something else that I can give him. And um, it was very hot and I had some water in my car. So I just gave him two bottles of, of, of water. You know, I drove up to him and put on my window and like gave him these two two bottles of water and he said like do you have 25 cents i said no why and he's like so i can call somebody who actually cares so i was like really thrilled i was like seriously man so yeah like giving can be challenging to some degree sometimes it's really awesome that you do this with your kid i'll definitely adopt this because that, that's that's really cool lessons yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to hear any any other tips, hacks, work-life balance tips, like all, you know, surrounded by family, because like what managing happiness is about is how you can, you know, manage better to between the work-life work, work -life yeah. balance tips and, you well, know, I, and any I, hacks. I think, you know, when I think of a, a hack or an idea that is has been profound for people in our organization and in our family, and when I give speeches, one of the things that always comes back is that we teach this philosophy, I mentioned it earlier, called who's in your front row. And I think one of the most important activities we can do, and we should do this every quarter, you know, every few months or so, twice a year at least, sit down and ask yourself, who are in my top eight? Uh, eight? Eight's a magic number for our charity, and I could go into why, but you know, who's in your top eight? And I find that uh, eight's a magical number for me to know who are my top friends or peers or people in life. Now, there's a couple different ways you can do this. First of all, you say, top eight, John, does that include God? Does that include business and personal and all that? And I'm like, well, here's a couple different ways you can do it. Number one is overall, everybody on the planet who's in your top eight. And right now, next to me, Dave, on my wall is my top eight. I'm looking at the names right now. And they're ranked in order of importance. Now, this is going to really rock people's world to do this the right way, because we <laughs> think sometimes that it should be like mom, dad, and then out of obligation, we should list our sisters or is it our cousins? Like, do we go by blood? And it gets people to really think about uh, who's in your who, who's in your top eight, uh, period. Uh, forget what you've been taught. Forget the agreements that you made, just like we said earlier with the four agreements, right? It's like, it's like and, and, and you know, I had a buddy say to me one time, rarely are members of the same family born under the same roof. So you get really clear about this. And I, I've done that and I wrote it on my wall about who are my top eight in life. That's a very powerful exercise to do. And a, a tough, tough one, one by the way. And so that's one, okay? Another way that you could do it is you could say, let me look at just my business. You could do top eight, just business relationships, okay? What eight people are most valuable 
in business in my world. Um, you could do this with friends. Uh, what friends? You could do it with family members. You could rank in different categories all day long. But for, for this purpose, this demonstration, I'm just going to say my recommendation is to look at life in general, all relationships over all, just your b- birth to death, who's going to be most important in your life right now. Not who was in the past, not who you hope to be in the future per se, but right now who is or could be, if you choose for them to be, most important to you. Now, question number two is not, so once you've got your list and you've ranked them in order, can you tell me what that list, those people, can you tell me what their number one dream or goal is this year? Wow. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's so deep because then I'm, I'm a huge fan of like, I live by providing value to other people. And like, once you figure this out, then you can just like, you know, go to town and so be like really valuable. Here's to what that- I found, Dave, is that people can't do it. They actually like, they even put like their spouse on the list. And then when I say, what's their number one dream or goal? They're like, oh man, I... I actually don't know. And and they and and even if they think they know, they're like, I wonder if I wonder if somebody pulled their spouse aside and asked the question and then tried to match up the answer to yours, would it be the same? Um and and how about so you go, well, what about these eight people, their dreams and goals? And what are you doing to be a fan for them? What are you doing to show up in their world right now to really lift them up? Because, you know, I think it's an old Zig Ziglar quote or something like that. But it's like, if you help enough people get what they want in life, you'll get what you want in life. And nothing feels better than taking the most important people in your life and helping them live out their dreams. And that should be at the core of our our activities. Like you talked about before, like you look at your calendar and say, you could say those eight people are really important, but if you don't even know what dream makes them come alive, if you're not doing anything to ask them about it, if you're not doing anything to support it, well, I mean... You know, I think you t- it's time to evaluate. And, and I think that's a step that people can take. And I think that's a step towards living a front row life. I think that's a step that will help your business. I think that's a step that will help your family. I think that's a step that will help you spiritually and at every level. Man, that's so freaking deep. I actually, when I did some research about you before the call, I was listening to um, the oh, Out yeah, of Charm yeah. interview with you, you know, with Jordan. And um, this is like one note that I took for myself and actually want to ask you about this. And this is, our, it's already on my to-do list to tackle this because I think that's, yeah. that's so powerful. Yeah, so, top eight. Thank you for that. I have like, I have a million more questions for you, but I know you have a hard stop in uh, seven minutes. So I want to be, you know, respectful of your time. And I'm German. All I like right. to be punctual. <laughs> and I, you know, w- w- wasting other people's time that's is it. like a very terrible thing. Um uh, one one more question that I ask everybody because you know I'm a huge book nerd and you're a huge book nerd. What are the top three books that have in, had the biggest impact in your life, and what was the last book that you've read? And you do something really cool. In case you don't will not mention it by saying this, you have your top books on the shelf right. next to you, and you have like That's books right. all over your house. You yeah. just just show That's me. That's right. It's, yeah, it's, and they're it's, everywhere. It's, it's, and it's and part of off. part of the front row factor, uh, the third area of focus is environment. It's how we shape an environment that causes us to do and behave in certain ways. Like as an example of that, and I'll answer the question here in a quick sec. But as an example of that, I took my my end table away. You know, we, we set these pieces of furniture in our house, like somehow that's what we're supposed to do, right? If we're, it, it, yeah, life tells yeah. me I'm supposed to have an end table there, right? And I'm like, well, what if I don't have an end table? What if I just stack up books? What if my end table is a stack of books? Um, and I've, I've done that and I realized that I read a lot more. When my end table is a stack of books, I read more, period, you know? And also my kids then see all the books and they, That's they, huge. it's their world too. It's like, I want to decorate my house with books, you know, forget the pictures that you buy at Target or Walmart or whatever BS store that you think you need to cover the wall with something and hang up something meaningful, right? Decorate your house with something meaningful. Forget what you're supposed to do. Be the, be your own chief marketing officer, right? The world's trying to market to you and advertise That's to awesome. you and tell you how you're supposed to be. Yep, yep, yep. You be your own chief marketing officer. Um, so here's what here's what I think. I think uh, the top three books of all time. Uh, this is easy to give you number one. The Ultra Marathon Man by Dean Carnassus is my number one b- pick. 
Uh, the book is over a decade now uh, out there in the world. Make, you know, this is one of my favorite books because it's a book about human potential. Doesn't matter if you're a runner or not, highly recommend it. Second book is um, one of my best friends in the world, uh, wrote a killer book called The Miracle Morning. His name is Hal Elrod. And Hal is also one of the top donors to the charity. So every time you buy The Miracle Morning book, a portion of the money comes back to Front Row Foundation, which is wonderful. That's a second book. And that that's a game changer. My my family practices it. My kids do Miracle Morning. Um, in fact, there's a Miracle Morning book for parents and families. Um, and the co-authors of that are great friends of ours. And also uh, Mike McCarthy, who's a co-author there, is a front row dad. And then the third book, which I would give you, is Essentialism by Greg McCune. And Greg, uh, who I've had on my podcast and as a friend, um, wrote a killer book, and I highly recommend it. Essentialism was a game changer. Uh, I read it in a coffee shop in the Netherlands, and it was just lit my world on fire. And I just absolutely love it. It's a book about knowing what's important to say yes to and what you want to say no to. So that those are my top three. Um, the book I just I'll, I'll give you the book I'm reading right now, which is How to Raise an Adult. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot of books presently, uh, you know, being, you know, somebody that's connected to the front row dads here and leading that group. I read constantly about parenting and how to raise an adult is what I'm currently into. And, and I think it's a great book. It's a little too early to tell if I'd highly recommend it, but I think it brings up a, a really good point of like, we can be overly engaged in our kids' lives and not let them experience life. We can think that engagement is all great, but we can actually turn that into smothering them. That's right. Yeah. So this parents. is a book that sort of challenges that. At least that's where it's at right now so far. But um, yeah, that's a book I'm into presently. John, this was so freaking awesome. I could extend this for another hour, but you have to go. Thank you very, very much. This was really, really cool. And yeah, any any parting words, any like sh shout outs, anything you're looking for, like hires, giveaways? I, I just, well, mention? listen, if you want to get a couple free chapters of the book, you can go to frontrowfactor.com and we'll give you a couple of chapters to check it out. Um, you know, the book's available on Amazon. And I, I would just say thank you, brother, for having me on. Really great to get connected. I uh, love what you're up to. Very exciting stuff. And I, I just know that our conversation will for sure continue. Um, I value people like yourself who are out there really trying to serve. Uh, not, let me take that back. Serving. You're not even trying to serve. Yeah, you are. You are. No and um, I, love that, I love that you're doing that because I think this is team human. I think we're all in it together. I think this is, this is one family. Um, I think that it was said best with the rising tide that lifts all ships. And I believe that if you know, by you helping the world, it helps my kids directly. Every time I do something that's positive, it helps your family directly. And I just hope that uh, we continue to build together and that we look back on life um, with as few regrets as possible to say that we, we really showed up big each and every day in service of others, operating with great values. And um, I just want to, I just want to be, I just want to be connected to awesome people like you. And I feel like we did that for the last hour and I'm grateful for that. Same here. Thank awesome, you very brother. much. That's awesome.